Tsonga. I am director of the WSI, which is the Institute for Economic and Social Research uh, of the German trade unions, and I'm also professor of public sector economics in the Netherlands, so I have two jobs, atypical uh, employment, as you would call it. Brigitte, what type of future is in store for social Europe? Well, we have, at the moment, we are looking for a model of uh, an utopia for a social Europe, and we have different uh, possibilities. Uh, at the moment, there is uh, one group who very strongly wants to go back to the nation state and basically uh, quit Europe, which is in Germany a very strong group. Uh, the other one would say we have to go only to a supranational Europe, which is Jürgen Habermas, for example, who would say we need just politics at the top and the way, do away with technocrats and the European Commission, uh, giving the, it less power and also the European courts. And then there is a model which I think I favor most, but it is not developed yet, which would say we should rely on self-regulation, on employers' association, trade unions, uh, on the old, since the medieval guilds existing institutions that Europe has, we should trust in variety, uh, because the original idea was we should stay different in Europe and not all become the same and benchmark. But still, we need at the supranational level some of the issues which have to be solved. And the social framework, what should be the minimum standards for a social Europe, should be set at a higher level because we should not accept two divergent uh, social outcomes uh, of Europe. And I think that is the direction I would suggest we should go and think further. <laughs> what are the challenges to that type of model that trusts in variety? The challenges are more, the question is, who should do it? Because at the national level, people say the European Union is doing too much. You shouldn't regulate the, the size of the cucumber and you shouldn't regulate all these things. But just let us do. On the other hand, who should do at the supranational level, who should think European? We still speak different languages, we are still very different, so how should possibly heads of government who join the, the European Council suddenly start thinking European? If we would manage that, this would be good. Others would say maybe it's political parties which are in, Europe, in the Europe, European Parliament which should be strengthened, which could uh, take up and uh, pick up ideas and basically force through more social standards. Others say it should be the European Court uh, of Human Rights uh, who should uh, make social issues a human right. So there are very many different ideas at the moment popping up which haven't been worked out, but what worries me is the ideas are not so new. Why hasn't it happened till now? So who would set the first step that something is happening? And why do you think it hasn't happened to now? Do you think there's some sort of ideological block on moving away from the limits of the debate as it is? Yeah, I think that the European Union goes in a one-side direction, which is competition above everything. And I think, especially after the financial crisis, people had expected, citizens had expected, that now financial markets would be regulated. That was the biggest market failures we have had since 50 years. But nothing happened. And so what is now is that we are all waiting who is going to, to, to see the curiosity of the citizens. I mean, it's two thirds of the European citizens who don't support it anymore. So there must be something which changes. But those who decide are not democratically elected. The technocrats of the European Commission are not elected, so we can also not vote them down. The, court, the, the judges of the European Court of Justice obviously are also not elected. So the people who decide do not react to the curiosity of uh, the citizens. And we must find a means, and it could be the European Parliament who could, who should change to also be able to take initiatives, because at the moment they are not allowed to take their initiatives on their own, to basically <laughs> force through social uh, topics. So we have not, the European architecture is not built uh, the way that the social issues could be introduced now easily. And the European Union should really take competition and cooperation at equal terms and not just say we do everything in competition. It's a wrong way. And how do we make that change? We must change that uh, very important groups in every country and also the heads of the government and also parliament raises these issues that the architecture of the European Union has to be changed soon. We should also ask for minimum standards, at least some minimum wages, some minimum pension claims, which all Europeans should share. At least the Europeans within the Eurozone should have a, a common goal. And these would be ways of 
starting it, but I'm an economist, this is political science you are asking me, but I think we are all concerned because I don't think this is the way it could continue in the long run. And economically, is it viable to do it this way, Bridget? Economically, it's even better. We have seen that the best countries, which also uh, survived the crisis the best, were countries with corporatist regimes, which means with self-regulatory regimes. And the fact that Ireland recovered quicker than other countries also shows that there are fundamental old institutions which somehow still work. It was the Danes, it was the Finns, it was the Austrians, it was the Germans which survived, or the Dutch, which survived the crisis much better than countries which do not have these strong self-regulatory regimes. So countries which work with cooperation rather than with com competing labor and capital each other survived the crisis much better. That's a very clear sign that cooperation <laughs> is a value per se and is in principle economically much more advisable than competition alone.